Navy store. I come from a very Navy family. Uh, my wife Janet is over here. She started her military career in the U.S. Army. She actually needed what's called an inter-service transfer into the Navy. My father, retired Naval officer, our firstborn of three boys, spent six years in the Navy. Uncle fought on Iwo Jima. So I come from a very Navy family. And my father uh, had some very definitive feelings. My Navy father had some very definite feelings about me going in the U.S. Army. And I think when I was a senior in high school, after badgering me and harassing me and nagging me, I think he finally came to the realization he wasn't going to change my mind. I was going to go in the Army. And, you know, I, I usually ignored all of this abuse, and, you know, about me wanting to go in the Army. But there was a couple of lines that Dad had that were, you know, sort of really cut to the quick. And I remember one of them he used to say, you know, when he realized it was hopeless. I was going to go in the Army no matter what. Um, there's one line he, he, that I will always remember that he used on me. He said, you know, son, Neanderthal man never really became extinct. He went in the Army. <laughs> and that's the one that hurt the most, I think, you know. But uh, I think when my, my wife did her transfer from the Army into the Navy, it was one of the, one of the greatest events, you know, as far as Dad was concerned. Um, this is the time that you see the book up here. Um, Again, a quick review. Jim gave you guys a great summary of what was going on in this region. And I'll try to stay as close to the mic as I can. Just the geography real quick, and I realize this map is a, is a little light. Um, let see, is the cursor moving? Yep. Okay. So here's the Philippines. Um, here is, very importantly for this campaign, what was then called Formosa, now Taiwan, which was owned by the Japanese, a lot of Japanese bases on that island. Jim mentioned the Japanese were getting their, their oil from what is today Indonesia, then the Dutch East Indies, you know, which was also very important in the early fighting in the Pacific. And as Jim mentioned, what brought things to a head between the US and the Japanese was when France fell to the Germans in 1940, the Japanese saw glittering opportunities to start moving in, you know, the Dutch fell, the, you know, the, the Germans overran Holland in 1940, France surrendered to the Germans in 1940, so the Japanese saw glittering opportunities in Asia. And as Jim mentioned, they moved in to what was then Indochina, today Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, and in the summer of 1941, when the Japanese moved in and took over French bases in Indochina, it presented a dire threat to the Philippines as well as to the British down here in Malaya and Singapore. That's what, uh, that's re the reason why Roosevelt embargoed oil in late July 1941. A day or two later, the British and Dutch uh, Jim, I know you remember that. It was like within a couple of days of Roosevelt's decision, the British and Dutch in the Far East agreed to also go along with the American embargo. The effect that that had, as Jim told you guys, Japan had virtually. Can you hear me out? Okay, they're great, great, even better. Uh, Japan had virtually no oil reserves. So when we, the British and Dutch, embargoed oil, the effect that it had was it basically pushed the Japanese up against the wall. We put our we put our thumb on their we put our thumb on their windpipe, and the Japanese had two choices. They were either going to have to back down and acquiesce to our demands, or they were going to come out swinging. And given the militaristic government of Japan in that era, there's little doubt that they were going to come out swinging. And that's exactly what happened. Um, it starts in December. Jim mentioned how MacArthur was very hopeful that the Japanese would wait until the following spring. So that's kind of the historical background of all this. Um, map of the Philippines, it's wonderful to see so many Filipinos in the room today. I've been talking to a lot of you all about various parts of the Philippines you come from. I have some very, very good friends in the Philippines. A historian friend of mine, a guy named uh, Rico Jose in the University of Manila, was a big help to me as I was doing research for this book, talking to me about the, the small Philippine Navy that was getting started under MacArthur that uh, Jim mentioned. This gives you some of the, the, the key data at the time. Uh, you know, the Philippines was about 17 million people according to 1940. 
1940 census. Still a commonwealth of the United States due to get its independence in July of 1946. You can see what the numbers were like, the number of American military personnel in the Philippines when war begins. Um, the U.S. Army in December 1941, 19,000 Americans. That was scheduled to be about 75,000 troops by, the, by April of 1942. When war begins, when Pearl Harbor is bombed, there's several convoys of American troops heading for the Philippines that are in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and never get there. And a lot more plan to follow behind them. Uh, so big American buildup. 12,000 Philippine scouts, you know, Filipino enlisted men under American officers, always considered an elite organization. Few of the scout officers were Filipinos. A few of them are West Point graduates, in fact. Philippine scout officers who were graduates of West Point. Uh, you can see the Navy totals. The Asiatic fleet, the, even though the U.S. Army's involvement in the Philippines began in 1898, as Jim and, and uh, Sherman pointed out, um, the, the, the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps had a much longer history operating in the Far East. Well, the U.S. Navy had been operating in Chinese waters since the 1850s, long before we got into the Philippines. So the Asiatic Squadron, later the Asiatic Fleet, had been around for a long, long time. Uh, the numbers that you see up there are American Navy sailors who were both ashore or on the ships of the Asiatic Fleet. Uh, Filipino reservists. It, it, how many of you guys have seen the great uh, Robert Montgomery, John Wayne movie, They Were Expendable, about the PT boats in the Philippines? So great classic World War II movie made in 1945. In that movie, you can see some Filipino uh, guys with the Americans on their PT boats. These are these Filipino naval reservists who were part of the U.S. Navy when the war began. Uh, and about 1,500 Marines. Uh, including the 4th Marine Regiment, which had been in Shanghai, China, from 1927 until just before war starts. In fact, the Marines escaped from China literally days, days before Pearl Harbor was bombed. So the, you know, the, the 1,500-something Marines you see up there, about half of them have been in the Philippines for a long time, about half just arrived from China right before the war started. That is, uh, many of you are familiar with the timeline here. You can just take a quick glance. This kind of complements what Jim was saying to you guys about how, um, uh, if you saw the movie Tora 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 ever, you see this famous war warning here where they thought, some people thought the war was going to begin in late November of 41. A war warning was sent out at that time. Um, you can see very late, very, very late. The Marines and the China gunboats are leaving China, sailing across the South China Sea to the Philippines. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Uh, war begins on 8th of December. As Jim pointed out, the majority of the Army Air Force was caught on the ground in the Philippines. He, he mentioned Bill Barge's book. I think it's called December 8th, 1941, MacArthur's Pearl Harbor. It's the story of the Army Air Force being caught on the ground in the Philippines on the first day of the war. You know, it's a very, very well done book. Bill Barge and I have known each other for years. Um, both been interested in this campaign. Uh, three, two, three days later, third day of war. Jim mentioned Canadian Navy, our only major base the Navy has west of Pearl Harbor. You know, they, they took it over from the Spanish. Canadian had been the big Spanish Navy base in the uh, 18th and 19th century. The Navy had been using it since the early 1900s. And I'll show you some pictures of what the Canadian Navy Yard looked like after the Japanese bombers finished with it on the third day of the war. And there, the Japanese landings take place here in this part of December, right before Christmas. And as Jim mentioned, the Philippine Army just wasn't ready. Um, the, the Filipinos could make very good soldiers. The scouts were fantastic soldiers. The, the Philippine Army was too new. It was too under-resourced. It wasn't ready to take on the Japanese. That's why the Japanese defeated them at the beaches. And they, they quickly had to go back to the original plan and head to Bataan and Corregidor. So, Siege of the Pan goes on three months from early January to early April, uh, and then 27 days later, after a terrific air and artillery bombardment of Craigor Island, the uh, garrison of Craigor uh, falls. That's Uncle Hart. That's the guy who told, who Jim told you, thought MacArthur was stir crazy, you know, by late 1941. They had been good friends for a long time. MacArthur Hart had been the superintendent of the Naval Academy. William Arthur had been the superintendent of West Point. Um, as I remember, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong here, I believe Hart, when he was a, 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 like a captain, he was one of the pallbearers 
Uh, Douglas MacArthur's older brother was a naval officer. He died on active duty of appendicitis and, and heart. I believe he was a captain at the time in the Navy. He was actually Paul Error from MacArthur's brother, um, died as a naval officer. Uh, I developed a lot of respect for this guy during my research at the war. He's MacArthur's direct counterpart. There was no joint command intelligence. We weren't that good at, at that time. You know, we had, if there's, if the, if the Asiatic fleet was very independent of MacArthur's Army Force in the Philippines. They were supposed to cooperate and work together, but Hart was not in charge of, at all of, of the Army, and Sam MacArthur had no direct control over the Navy. Okay? But uh, the Hump Tom, he'd been in command of the Asiatic Fleet since 1939, so they're not in the Philippines for a while by the time war started. Um, the other Navy, there were one of several Navy admirals out there, uh, Admiral Rockwell. He's the guy who actually stays in the Philippines and leaves with MacArthur when MacArthur departs by PT boat in March. Admiral Rockwell is with him when he leaves. Uh, he's a commandant of the 16th Naval District. He was at the Kabiti Navy Yard the day the Japanese just pounded the Kabiti Navy Yard. Basically, he was in charge of the Navy shore facilities like Alonco and Kabiti when, uh, when war began. Uh, in the middle there is Colonel Howard. He's the senior Marine who fought in this campaign, CEO of the 4th Marines. He took command of the 4th Marines in China in May of 1941. He evacuates the 4th Marines to the Philippines, as you saw from those dates, a week before war begins. So when those Marines get out of China and make it to the Philippines. So in the middle there is uh, Colonel Howard. On the uh, left is one of his battalion commanders of the 4th Marines. And on the right is Deputy General George Moore, who was the Harbor Defense Command. He was the commander of the Fortress Island, uh, Corregidor, and the other the other island forts. Um, the reason why you see that picture taking place: the Fourth Marines ended up being the main beach defense unit on Corregidor. When the Japanese landed on Corregidor in May of 1942, they were fighting most of the American Marines on the beaches. And the regimental commander there is Colonel Howard. Um, so not all three of those guys survived the prison camp. They all were taken prisoner by the Japanese, and they all they all survived prison camp. Um, I just a picture some of the ships that were out there in the Far East. That's Admiral Hart's flagship, the Houston, uh, eight-inch gun cruiser, uh, crew of about a thousand men. Houston, like most, went after the Kabiti Navy Yard was bombed. After the Kabiti Navy Yard was bombed to smithereens on the 10th of December, most of the big Navy ships in the Philippines had to head south. Japanese had air superiority, their base had been bombed out, so ships like this, they, they stay in the Philippines for a few days, and they head south to fight the Dutch and the British. Houston was lost in a very dramatic night battle off the coast of Java. The Navy didn't know what had happened to the ship for two years. And the way they find out about what happened in Houston in 1943 is guys who have escaped from Japanese prison camps who survivors of the Houston were in their camp. They tell the Navy, hey, some guys from Houston were in my prison camp. It was the first time the Navy found out what had happened to this ship. It was, it was lost in a you know, wild night battle along the Australian cruise of Perth uh, fighting Japanese landing in, in Java in March 1942. Um, the, the, these are the so-called four pipers, the, the flush decker type destroyers. The Navy built a couple of hundred of these during the World War I period. Thirteen of them were the Asiatic fleet um, when war begins. Uh, 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 well, half of them are lost in, in, the, in the fighting in that, in that region, including most of them lost you now fighting the Dutch south of the Philippines. But so thirteen of these World War I type destroyers were there. How many of you guys ever saw the great 1960s Steve McQueen movie, The Sand Pebbles? Um, then you should recognize this. You know, terrific movie about the Navy in China in the 1920s that Steve McQueen starred in. Um, three of these gunboats were in China, one in Hong Kong, two in Shanghai, and when they pulled the Marines out to get into the Philippines just before war started, uh, these three little ships that were never designed to travel in the open ocean. They were built in Chinese shipyards under contract with the Navy in the late 1920s. They spent their whole life in Chinese waters, Chinese rivers. Flat bottomed, they drew about eight feet of water. That's all flat bottom boats. And um, I got the log books of some of these. The log books still exist. They were evacuated from the Philippines before the surrender. And so there's stories when they were sailing from Shanghai over to Manila, it was typhoon season, and there's records in the logbooks that these things going through typhoons 
they would roll 45 degrees to starboard and 50 degrees to port and manage not to capsize. That's when you're glad you're in the Army. Okay, but these three, these three little gunboats, when most of the Navy ships headed south to fight with the British and the Dutch, these are the kind of ships that were left behind in Manila Bay to support the Army. So those three gunboats that you see there were, were part of the Navy contingent, fought throughout the entire Batan Corregidor campaign. Um, uh, the USS Quail, one of, one of four ships of this class, minesweepers that stayed in the Bay, again, like those gunboats, supporting the Army, patrolling the flanks of the tan, providing naval gunfire, sweeping mines, this kind of thing. Um, the largest ship in the Batan Navy, there's a submarine tender there, the Canobus. The Navy left that sub tender in Manila Bay to try to allow submarines to operate from Manila Bay as long as possible. Hundreds of her crew, crew, about 600 men, hundreds of her crew fought as infantrymen on both Bataan and Corregidor. Okay, very unusual stuff the sailors had to do in this campaign. That's the type of PT boat. There were six of them. There were supposed to be 12. The day the war begins, the other half a motor torpedo boat, Squadron 3, was a dead cargo on a ship sitting in Pearl Harbor. You know, it was en route to the Philippines, they didn't make it. So half of the squadron, six boats. This, in fact, is the boat, the PT-41. That's the one that actually took MacArthur off Corregidor and got him down to Mindanao, the Southern Islands. Navy had 28 of these PDYs flying boats in the Philippines. Many of the crews of these aircraft ended up fighting as infantrymen on the hand because the airplanes were all lost or had fled down to the Dutch East Indies. So just like the crew of the Canopus, a lot of the, the Navy sailors or the, the, uh, the ground crew or the air crew of these kind of planes um, uh, fought as infantrymen alongside the Army of the Hand. Picture what these guys look. It was quite common. Compared to today, it's a lot more common for sailors of that era to be part of the so-called landing parties. So this is a scene aboard uh, the, the Mindanao, that gunboat I showed you a few minutes ago. It's a late 1930s scene of a group of sailors about to go ashore and do something in China, so low on the Chinese rivers. So some of these sailors had some, a little bit, kind of, training in you know, how to use small arms and infantrymen. Uh, that's a picture of Fourth Marines. That's a Marine gun, uh, a machine gun detachment. And, and notice, this is what they fought in in the early part of the war. Notice the World War I type steel helmets, the khaki uniforms. That's all the way until the Battle of Midway in June of 1942. The Americans were fighting out in the Pacific. This is what they look like. Not the, the, the classic M1 steel helmet that you think about most of the troops fighting in World War II, or the olive draft uniforms. The early war fight was all done. Guys who look like this. Um, Marines on Corregidor teaching Filipinos how to use a machine gun. Uh, the four Marines, by the end of the campaign, there were about 1,500 Marines in the regiment. The regiment was up to about 3,600 people because it had a bunch of U.S. Army guys in it, had a bunch of sailors in it, had hundreds and hundreds of Filipinos were part of the 4th Marine Regiment by the time they finally surrendered on Corregidor. So that's Marines teaching Filipinos how to use a machine gun. Uh, Jim mentioned how MacArthur wanted the Philippines to develop their own little kind of small navy with their own version of a PT boat. These were so-called Q boats. The plan was to build about 50 of these. When the war started, there were only three available. That's a picture of one in Manila Bay shortly before the war started. Uh, my friend in Manila, uh, Dr. Rico Jose, had done a lot of work about the, uh, the background of these Cubos and what they did during the Batan campaign. It's a big help to be giving me that kind of information. Um, here's the area most of the fighting takes place in. As Jim mentioned to you guys, uh, you know, once the Japanese win the beaches, you know, up here is the Lakapo and Subic Bay. Manila's over here. Here's the Kamiki Navy Yard. Um, here's uh, the, the Batan Peninsula and Corregidor and other islands. So most of the fighting takes place right in here. And as Jim mentioned, the, for decades, the plan had been War Plan Orange. That was the, the, the plan all during the 1920s, all during the 1930s. Fall back to the camp and Corregidor, hope that the Navy can make it from Hawaii and come to your rescue. MacArthur changes that to fight on the beaches. That doesn't work. They have to revert back to our war plan orange. Um, there's Corregidor, 
The Navy has some uh, very important tunnels on the river. That's the very famous Malenta Tunnel that some of you all may have visited. Uh, down here on a place called Monkey Point was a top secret radio, uh, Navy radio intercept tunnel. Um, this is the first place. This is one of the, the, the super secret uh, places the Navy had scattered throughout the Pacific to listen to Japanese codes, try to break Japanese codes. All these guys were evacuated by submarine. The Navy did not want these guys falling into the hands of Japanese. There are about 80 of them. They took them out in three different submarine loads in February, March, and April 1942. Um, I've got a, a very interesting passage by uh, one of the uh, Navy Petty Officers in the last group to leave, the third group to be evacuated. And before they were evacuated, he and the, the, like the three remaining officers, they were down to like 25 guys at that point, and he and the, the, the three officers in the group made an agreement that if the Japanese landed on Corregidor, before they could be evacuated to Australia, they were going to shoot all their own men, and then they were going to shoot themselves, because it was that important that these codebreaker guys not fall into the hands of the Japanese. Um, entrance to Manila Bay, there's Bataan, here's Corregidor. What you see here are the minefields that were put in place at entrance to Manila Bay before the start of the war. A lot of people know about Corregidor. What's much less well known is there were three other harbor forts at entrance to the harbor. Fort Hughes, Fort Drum, and Fort Frank, much smaller than Corregidor. All had been fortified by the Army back in the years before World War I. Uh, you know, so I'll show you what so the gun positions look like. That's the kind of weapon that was on Corregidor, the so-called disappearing gun. That's a 12-inch that fires, and then recoils back behind that concrete wall. That's why it's called disappearing fire. It's about a thousand-pound shell. Um, because the Army didn't have enough gun crews, a lot of sailors ended up manning these weapons on mostly on some of the other uh, islands like Fort Hughes. They had heavy mortars like this, firing a 700 pound shell. The Navy had a battalion of sailors, I'll tell you about just a minute, that fought on southern Bataan. These guns from Craigor, these mortars from Craigor, fired onto Bataan in support of the sailors that were fighting like infantry. Any of you Filipinos ever seen this? Anyway, this is the famous concrete battleship, the Army's Fort Drum. At the entrance of Manila Bay, I'll just go back for just a moment. It's right here. Uh, it, it started out when the, Spanish, when the Spanish were there. It was like a, a one-acre outcrop of rocks in Manila Bay. For about 12 years, the Army Corps of Engineers worked on this thing. They blasted the, the pile of rocks down to the waterline, and they built this concrete fortress with like battleship turrets, 14-inch guns on top of the 30-foot uh, thick concrete walls, 20-foot thick concrete roof. The Japanese didn't, couldn't touch this thing. It was still firing five minutes before the flag came down on the The Japanese just could not knock this thing out. There were about 250 people inside it. Um, committee, uh, this is the, so the city of Committee over here. This area over here was the Kitty Navy Yard. As I mentioned, this was the only significant facility the Navy had in the Western Pacific when the war started. They'd taken it over from the Spanish. So again, the, this peninsula, the Kibiti Peninsula, was shared with the city of Kibiti. Um, that's another view. This is Sangley Point in the background. You can see these 600 foot radio towers the Navy had. This is a late 1930s picture of Navy planes flying over the very, 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 very crowded Kibiti Navy Yard. Crowded. Not good when the bombers show up. All right? And on the third day of war, Japanese bombers showed up. Japanese Navy bombers coming from Formosa, now Taiwan, the, 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 uh, the G3M Nell and the G4M Betty. About, um, about 50 of these attacked the Kabiti Navy Yard. Um, there was a big air battle over Manila. As Jim pointed out, MacArthur's Air Force had taken a big hit on the first day of war. On the third day of war, when the Japanese go after Kabiti, most of the surviving P-40s get up into the air over Manila to try to protect the Manila area. They lose. They lose. Uh, the Japanese Zeros beat them, and you know it, it basically finishes off Army air power in the Philippines. This big air battle took place over Manila on the third day of the war. That's a picture of the Navy Yard under attack. 
you know, have one of the Japanese bombers were actually there. Here's some pictures of what it looked like after the Japanese finished with it. Um, I like to say, I've said in my book, this is the worst pounding a U.S. naval installation installation has ever taken. If you know anything about the Pearl Harbor raid of three days before this, Pearl Harbor was only three days earlier, the Japanese went after the ships of the Pacific Fleet. They basically they didn't touch the Navy shore of the Soviets in Hawaii. Uh, very different to be. They flattened the Canadian Navy Yard. Several hundred Filipinos were also killed during the bombing. Most of the people who lived in the city could be. More pictures of what the Navy Yard looked like. So, as Jim mentioned, by late December, early January, they have the fall band that revert back to Warp Bay Orange. They go back to Batan Peninsula. Up here is a lot of Poland Subi Bay. Down here is Corregidor. Here is Batan, where the Army goes into defensive positions. And about three weeks after the fighting starts on Batan, the Japanese start conducting amphibious landings. They start up here in Longapo, and they, at night, they take hundreds of troops by barge, and they bring them down to the east coast, west coast of Batan to kind of get behind the Army's lines. That's why they're landing back there, to get behind the Army. And down here, on the very southern tip of Batan, when the Japanese made this landing, the only nearby unit was the battalion of sailors. Guys who had lost their ships, guys who had lost their airplanes, guys who were survivors of the bombed out Canadian Navy Yard. And uh, imagine this, about 600 guys in this battalion, including about 50 or 60 Marines. So picture yourself just like a Marine sergeant who's suddenly given about eight to ten sailors who have guns and live ammunition. And the sergeant is told, here's your squad, young man. Do great things, okay? Really tough for these Marines. The Marines were spread throughout the whole battalion, you know, just to try to teach the sailors what they were doing. And um, the, um, uh, uh, the Japanese, the, when the Japanese landed down here, as I mentioned, the only nearby unit was this naval battalion. They ended up fighting the Japanese from a standstill. Philippine scouts finally came in and overwhelmed the, um, uh, the landing site. So it was one of the more unusual events that took place in the campaign. Uh, there's this PD boat again the back of MacArthur in mid-March. When Admiral Rockwell goes with MacArthur, the senior Navy guy becomes Captain Hoffel. Uh, so he, Kirk Howard, a senior Marine. Captain Hoffel is a senior Navy officer. Uh, there's about 2,300 sailors in addition to those 1,500 or so Marines that are there. Uh, those that say Captain Hoffel's one of only three Navy captains taken prisoner of World War II. The governor of Guam was a Navy captain. The head Navy doctor in the Philippines was a captain. And Captain Hoffel, who uh, took over from Admiral Rockwell, was only three Navy 06s captains who were captured during the Second World War. Hoffel's one that's that picture actually taken on Corregidor by the Japanese a day or two after the surrender on Corregidor. He also survived the prison camp. Uh, he made it to the end of the war. The Tan Death March, uh, the Tan campaign lost almost exactly three months. Uh, 9th of April, 1942, uh, 75,000. It's important for Americans to remember, really important for Americans to remember, that when the Tan surrenders, of the 75,000 guys who surrender, about 65,000 are full. It's really important for Americans to keep that in mind. Majority of defenders of the Tan were Filipinos. And as Jim mentioned, you know, the death march taking place. These guys were very weak from lack of food. They were, just, they were full of all kinds of diseases. Japanese were very brutal to them. No one will ever know how many people died on the death march, but it was a lot. A lot of guys died, mostly Filipinos on the death march. Uh, most of the sailors, you can see a handful of Marines on the death march. Uh, almost all the sailors and Marines that have been made should have escaped the corridor before the surrender of the hand. So just a handful of sailors and Marines were captured on, on the hand. Uh, this is a map from my book. I actually took this. The chairman has in his collection the entire Japanese history of World War II. Actually, it goes back to what, China in 1931, I think. It goes all back to the fighting in Asia in 1931. He loaned me a copy of the, uh, uh, the volume of Japanese history on the fall of the Philippines. And uh, this is an adopted from a diagram or map in the Japanese officials. This shows how Corregidor and the other islands were caught in a crossfire. It's all the artillery the Japanese brought to the southern Japan and over here in Tahiti. So they had the, uh, they bombarded Corregidor for 27 days. 
about 120 Japanese guns, five, six, seven, eight air raids a day, in addition to all that Japanese artillery fire. Um, here's a picture of the Japanese bombers flying over the tail of Corregidor. This is the part of Corregidor the Japanese landed on on the 5th of May. Uh, very, very, very heavy fighting. Hundreds of guys killed on both sides in the fight over the tail of Corregidor. Over here is Fort Hughes, one of those other islands. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Okay, this is Fort Hughes, about a mile south of Corregidor. Here's General Wainwright. Uh, the afternoon of the 5th of May, or I think that's actually just the, the, the uh, 7th of May, in Manila, the Japanese have been on the radio in Manila telling the units in the southern Philippines they have to surrender. Uh, Wainwright was terribly afraid that the Japanese were going to really abuse, if not kill, the 12,000 Americans and Filipinos they'd taken prisoner on Corregidor on May 6th. So this is him on the radio broadcasting to the units, the American and Filipino units still fighting in the southern Philippines. Yeah, you gotta surrender. You guys have gotta surrender. And of course, most of them do, many of them don't, and those guys who don't become the nucleus of the guerrilla bands and start being formed to resist the Japanese occupation. Um, just about everybody surrendered. Just about, there were about 12,500 Americans and Filipinos who surrendered on Correct or those other three island forts. Not everybody surrendered. And there's Fort Hughes. On the morning of the surrender, the skipper of the minesweeper quail. The minesweeper is anchored, badly damaged. It's anchored out here in this what the Navy calls South Harbor between Corregidor and Fort Hughes, about a mile of water right there. And uh, Lieutenant Commander Morrell, the skipper of the quail, goes on to Fort Hughes where most of his crew is ashore and he collects as many guys as he can. It's the, after, it's the, evening. It's the evening of May 6th. The surrender had taken place at noon on May 6th. Japanese are on Corregidor. Japanese are not yet on Fort Hughes. So Commander Morrell gets as many of his crew together as possible and says, look guys, it's over. General Wainwright has ordered us to surrender. We're, you know, and, and I'm giving you guys a choice. You can, the Japanese will probably be here tomorrow. They'll probably arrive on the island tomorrow to take control of the island. You can stay here and surrender and take your chances with the Japanese, or you can come with me. Because at a dock here on the edge of Fort Hughes, he and some of his crew have a 36-foot motor railboat that they have loaded with guns and fuel and food and charts and navigating gear. 17 members of his crew decide to go with him. So around 10 o'clock at night, surrender's taking place at noon, about 10 o'clock that night, under cover of darkness, this 36-foot motor railboat goes right out the entrance of Manila Bay, right over the top of the minefields, and it turns south. And they sail at night, they hide out the shore during the day. They sail at night, they hide out the shore during the day, moving southward, 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 southward. They leave Manila Bay on the night of the 5th of the 6th of June. I'm sorry, the night of the 6th of May, 1942. On the 6th of June, 1942, one month later, this little 36 foot motor railboat is chugging into Darwin Harbor, Australia. I can't believe they made it. 2,000 miles, 2,000 miles to Japanese controlled waters. And they pull up to a dock in Darwin. There's some Australian military people on the pier. Morell, Commander Morell, gets off his boat, just, just, just giddy that they made it. He reports and tells his story. And what do you think the Australians do? They arrest them. <laughs> because the Australians don't believe it. This, this is a, some cook, these guys are a bunch of American deserters. They cooked up this BS story, and we don't believe it, and so the Australians arrest these guys as obviously American deserters. Well, Morell can't believe it. He demands to see the senior American military officer in Darwin, who happens to be an army colonel, and the colonel comes to the jail where the Australians have Morell and the 17 crew members, and the colonel's a West Pointer. 
and Morell's Naval Academy grad. And the colonel starts quizzing Morell on the score of Army Navy games. And when Morell knows the answers, the colonel is convinced this guy's legit. Did Army so, win back in those days? Uh, <laughs> no, it, it was bleak back in those days, like it is, has been lately. Okay, so they, they let him go, and there they are. That's them. And um, that, there, there's Commander Morell, wonderful little short guy. He ends up retiring from the Navy as a rear admiral. And the story that I just told you guys, Janet and I heard that from him at his farm in Bland, Virginia, in rural southwestern Virginia, in, at the breakfast table of his farm shortly after his 92nd birthday. Okay, is when he told us that story. Um, campaign ends in May of 1942. The survivors, Americans and Filipinos, no surrender, start a guerrilla war against the Japanese and Jim and, and Sherman mentioned been a whole the successful resistance operations against the Japanese anywhere in Southeast Asia. Um, mostly army campaign, Philippine Army, American Army. You can see that between the fall of Corregidor and the fall of the Tan, Japanese take about 21,000 Americans prisoner, mostly on the Tan, many of them on Corregidor. Of that total, about 2,300 are sailors and almost 1,500 are Marines. And um, by the time they are released at the end of the war, you can see what the numbers look like. About a third of, almost a third of the sailors and almost exactly a third of the Marines um, didn't make it. Those, those percentages are very similar for the Army guys, by the way. In, in, in fact, if you were a Brit captured in Singapore, if you were a Dutchman captured in Java, if you were a Canadian who surrendered in Hong Kong, if you were an Indian soldier taken prisoner in Burma, uh, the odds are remarkably similar. Uh, you know, roughly three years later when the war ends, there's about one in three, one in three chance you haven't made it. Okay, that's what it's like to be a prisoner of Japanese. Um, so the casualties among the American naval people were quite high. When Bataan fell, the Japanese moved the prisoners up to Camp Obama. They segregated the Filipinos and the Americans. When Corregidor fell, they added the Filipino prisoners from Corregidor to the Filipinos who were at Camp Obama ready for Bataan. Late in 1942, the Japanese paroled the survivors. Basically, they said to them, uh, go back to your town, go back to your village, we're going to be watching you. We don't want any trouble out of you guys. Go back, work to your homes. We don't want any trouble out of you. And you can see what the numbers look like that out of about 55,000 Filipinos who were at Camp Obama in the spring of 1942, by say June 1942, that 26,000 of them had died by the time the Japanese paroled them at the end of 1942 and told the survivors to go back to their homes. Um, so again, as you guys know, I, I did this book to tell another part of the story of this campaign, very heroic story, even though this campaign was to defeat the Americans and Filipinos. Uh, you know, I wanted to tell what, what had previously been sort of an underappreciated part of the story what the sailors and Marines did in this largely army campaign. Over to you guys. Thank you.